So good morning all. Uh, welcome to the latest ITSoft webinar where we're going to be taking a look at the latest legislative change to impact on accounts payable and finance and that's the VAT element of the broader making tax digital legislation. My name's John Stovold. I'm UK Marketing Manager. To start with, um, just going to have a quick look at the agenda with you all, and it should be coming through to you. So, as you can see, we uh, we will be closing with a, a look at some FAQs. Now we have shared a link to this deck already, so you will have seen a few of the questions that we uh, came across regularly online whilst uh, researching for this webinar. However, we will also try and answer any questions that you uh, may have as, as we progress through. So on this note, on the right hand side of your screens, there should be a box. Please do feel free to post your questions there. We will, of course, answer as many as possible at the end of the session. Any questions that we can't get through, we will come back to you afterwards. And of course, all questions will remain anonymous. So before we really get going, it's worth noting that this notice applies only to organisations that are VAT registered and whose taxable turnover is above the VAT threshold for reporting. Within the notice, though, there is information included for organisations whose turnover is below the threshold uh, should they wish to follow these, uh, these best practices. If you're unsure, please do check internally with your accounting team. No doubt they will very quickly be able to answer whether this applies to your business. And if so, they may even be able to tell you what steps they've already taken to ensure compliance with the legislation. And first up then, what is it that you need to know for the purposes of this webinar? So as uh, alluded to, does it even apply to yourselves? Very clearly detailed within the notice and simply put, as I've mentioned, this applies to any organization that's legally required to currently submit a VAT return. Our focus here today is on one particular segment of the notice. Uh, however, the notice actually contains far broader implications for organizations. The current methods for completing and submitting VAT returns, for example, will no longer be accepted. Within the notice, there are some uh, limited exceptions as to, to who has to comply. Uh, the primary one is details on your screens. And uh, again, it's the, the taxable turnover um, having never exceeded the threshold. So at the time of compiling the information for this webinar, that was £85,000 per year. When do we need to be ready? Well, from today's date, uh, time is now actually pretty critical for any organization that hasn't yet started working on ensuring compliance. It may not be something you've been made aware of. There's a very high probability, though, that your organization will have already started working on this. You may find when you look at the um, the notice further, the impacts are far broader than will initially have been considered. As mentioned, part of the notice is about how a VAT return should be submitted and whether particular accounting packages are compatible or not. Uh, on this point, do engage around your organization and your business. Check that your current accounting software is sufficient to ensure compliance. Again, within the slide deck, towards the end, there's a series of links that will take you to uh, relevant online resources, and one of those details uh, all of the ERPs or finance packages uh, that are currently compliant for the legislation. There is also uh, a number of free API tools that can bridge the gap for organizations whose finance package cannot make the final submission as required. So compliance is expected as of the 1st of April next year. There is flexibility built into the notice. Um, that flexibility predominantly relates to an organization's own tax year, but also includes what HMRC has termed a soft landing period, and that's to ensure that processes and systems are compliant. So, is this legislation really your problem? Well, yes, it is. 
as I've mentioned within the notice, there's a particular section that will explicitly impact on the way in which accounts payable and receivable will receive, handle, manage and store data. The legislative notice contains some very specific rules around the management and storage of information, and that includes uh, what information is required and in what format. Now, this becomes particularly important for the purposes of auditability and accountability. From an invoice's received perspective, this lands this squarely in the court of accounts payable. The section of the notice that I've already alluded to is section three. Uh, this is why we're interested in this. Uh, however, before we go to that, we'd like to just set the scene and we'd like to just ask uh, those of you that have joined us today, uh, how you currently move data from invoices that you're receiving into your finance system. So we're gonna be launching a poll question in a moment and there'll be three options with that. Option one is manual input of data. Option two is automated capture and processing. And the third option is other, and that may be that you have some sort of a, a hybrid uh, process in place. So the poll should be up on your screens uh, about now. And I'd like to just give you all a, a couple of minutes just to, to think about that and, uh, and submit your answers. Okay, last couple of moments here. Looks like the vast majority of you have already submitted. Three, two, one. Okay, we're going to close the poll up and let's have a quick look and see what answers we're seeing here. Okay, so the vast, well, just, just about 50% of you in attendance at the moment actually manually input your data from supplier invoices and the uh, the least have selected other. But yeah, 48% of, of you have uh, said that it's a manual process at the moment within the organization. So thank you very much for that. And that leads us nicely on to section three. And uh, as I've said, this is the specific area of legislation that interests us for the purpose of this webinar. Uh, the section itself is titled Digital Record Keeping, and it contains very specific information relating to the life cycle of an invoice upon receipt. Now it's highlighted with two examples uh, in the notice. The first of these is on your screen now. It's taken directly from the notice and revolves around what we at IT Software would term a manual accounts payable process, uh, whereby invoices received into the business are manually keyed into accounting software or ERPs. As it currently stands, an organization that is still manually processing its invoices could then scan those invoices and store them electronically. So they've received it as a piece of paper or maybe as an email or email attachment that's been printed out and then manually keyed that data into the finance package. As I say now, you could then scan those for storage purposes. However, the wording in this example would suggest that doing so is no longer sufficient and that the original copy of the invoice should be retained. Now, if you've received it as an email and you've keyed from the image, that would say that you can keep the email or the PDF as the original copy. However, if you've received a piece of paper with that data on and keyed it in, you would then need to keep that piece of paper. Uh, IT soft, when we were researching this, we thought, well, actually, that's a bit of a conflict with current rules and processes. We've spoken to a number of third parties, and it really is a much grayer area than it would first appear. From our side, we, we can only recommend that you discuss this with uh, any internal support teams that you have, and probably with your auditors as well, uh, and take their advice on here. Obviously, it remains to be seen whether there will be any further clarity offered uh, around this particular example. The second example then relates to a more automated process. So within this one, there's no manual touch from receipt of an invoice, post it being scanned, 
Um, and this would be, for example, where an OCR or an ICR solution is in use. Now, again, the example is on the screens in front of you. And in both of these instances, these have been taken directly from the notice. We've, we've not edited these in any manner. Now, in this example, it states that the original document no longer needs to be retained for audit purposes, as long as there is an image of the invoice stored electronically, and that this image is supported with metadata confirming the life cycle of the invoice, including date and timestamps, etc. So for most of you that replied that you're using an automated solution at the moment, if that genuinely means there is no manual processing of data, from receipt of the invoice to it going into the finance system, you will probably find that you don't need to do much around that for the purposes of this legislative change. For some older systems though, do be a little bit cautious, do speak to your IT team or your support and ensure that you are not just keeping an image of the invoice, but that the metadata is available as well. Uh, that is going to be an integral part of this. I've mentioned already that there's potential impacts around this, and we've just looked at the two key examples or the two examples from the legislative notice itself. What I'd like to just do is take this a step further and actually look at how this could impact on accounts payable. I've already mentioned scan to archive, um, where you've got a manual process, you're then scanning it and storing it. This is a really gray area, and you will need to seek further clarity than we can give you over the course of this webinar. If we take the notice at face value, example one that we looked at a moment ago would suggest that scan to archive platforms on their own are simply not sufficient. The example states they must still keep the invoice in its original form as the data in the functional compatible software is not a copy of the invoice. If we assume that this is not amended and that there's no further clarity, it means that in an accounts payable function where invoices are manually keyed into a package, the original physical copy of the invoice should also be retained. And as I've mentioned, this does appear to conflict against current rules around this. So the other element that could be impacted here is for organizations who have actually outsourced uh, an element of their invoice processing uh, or at least the data entry element and there could be some similar issues here to to what we've just looked at now an awful lot of this will depend on how your outsource provider actually receives and captures the data for you for instance do they do it manually or are they using an electronic process the biggest question then being is who is responsible for storing what historical data and documents. And that does become particularly important if, as a result of this notice, physical copies should now be retained. There's a second underlying element to this as well, and it relates to how you handle your data once you have it back in your business. So the notice explicitly states that you cannot, uh, they reference cut and paste, but copy and paste data between platforms or solutions. So if you are currently doing any of that, that has to stop and there has to be some form of bridging software that can replace that task. Um, the first example that springs to mind is that your outsource provider sends you an EDI feed uh, with uh, lines with all of the input invoice data on it, but you needed internal sign off for a, a particular line. You would not be able to copy and paste that line out of the EDI feed into uh, an email, for example, and send that to somebody for authorization for it to then come back and be copied and pasted back into the EDI feed. That would be editing that original form and would not be accepted. So we'd like to just come back to you uh, again and, and just ask you a, another quick question based on what we've looked at there. Uh, and it's just to see whether any of you on here are using uh, archive tools or, or maybe you've actually outsourced your accounts payable process. Again, three elements will be on your screen, uh, three options, sorry, will be on your screen in a moment. You have a scan to archive solution used after a manual process, an archive solution used as part of an automated process or that you've outsourced. So we'll launch the poll for you now and give you a couple of moments to uh, just select your answers before we move on.
Okay, last few seconds, and we will uh, we'll hit pause on this and have a quick look at the answers. Okay, so unsurprisingly, of those of you that responded, uh, it's almost exactly the same number as said you manually processed your invoices you have uh, scanned to archive used after the event. Uh, about 40% of you uh, have it as part of an automation tool and 10% uh, of you have outsourced. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, maybe a little surprised by only 10% with an outsourced, but it's really interesting to see that 49% of you manually processing your invoices and have a scan to archive solution used after the fact. So it's for those of you doing that, that this legislation could have the biggest impact on your current processes. So if HMRC doesn't consider the use of cut and paste to select and move information, uh, either within a software program or between software programs, what do they consider to be, as they have termed it, a digital link? Now on your screens and on the presentation we sent you a, a link over to, there's a, a list, and again, this has been taken from the notice. Um, it's not exhaustive, and it does say that in the list as well. So there may well be workarounds that you've come up with internally, or that a, a third party can suggest to you, or, or that HMRC simply just haven't thought of, uh, and they leave it quite open for, for that um, ingenuity to be to be brought into to bear on this. Finally, on on this element, um, the, as we've mentioned already, the current processes are no longer accepted, which is for a lot of businesses the online portal. Um, your ERP now has to be able to make the submission digitally to a required platform. And as I have said, is not all ERPs are listed as certified, and, and they may not be. There was a particular notable exception of Oracle when last I looked at the listing. Um, there will probably be other platforms that are in use out there that, uh, that aren't showing on the list. The link is on one of the last slides in the deck. It takes you to the Gov website, and the, the list of ERPs or, or accounting packages are, are all on there. So for those of you that have got the manual processing and the, the, the scan to archive, if this is an area of concern, what can be done in preparation? If we consider the worst case scenario, and that's that your scan to archive tools, for example, uh, simply don't comply with what's needed, what are the risks and the impacts of that? Well, it stands to reason that the impacts of reverting to a completely manual process with manual storage within accounts payable or receivable would be significant. So not least in the amount of time that your teams would have to spend manually processing the invoices, but broader than that. If you're scanning to archiving and disposing of the pieces of paper and you now have to retain those, how much office space, storage space, etc., would you need to find and allocate for that? Put simply, how much space would you need to find to store six or seven years worth of invoices, reconciliation statements, and so on? And don't forget, this isn't just accounts payable. It would apply to accounts receivable invoicing as well. Do you have enough staff to even manage that? Or would you need to go out there and try and recruit as well? Something probably less tangible is how much visibility would you even have around the processes? We're living in an age of, of big data and, uh, you know, if everything is in bits of paper that have been stamped and signed and scribbled on and then put into a file, how, how helpful is that to you as an organization to make, make real judgments on your processes? With this in mind, surely the preference would be to move to a process that's covered within example two and to use systems to ensure compliance from receipt of incoming information. As with the previous point, it's no likely a surprise to you that digital processes, and this is called making tax digital, should be the better fit for organizations. And I'm not gonna labor this point. You guys have come along today. You know that this is what we do. Uh, what I will just say is that for every issue and pitfall a manual process has, a digital process has an answer. And in fact, for every benefit of a manual process, that benefit is only accentuated in a digital one. The key is 
time and the restriction of time from this point to the compliance needing to happen for a lot of organizations fully tailored on-premise automation solutions are just not viable uh, and even if they are they take time it takes time to select vendors uh, plan solutions build and test platforms etc and that's assuming you even have budget uh, available for a project of this nature now cloud solutions they may not have been perfect but they have come on leaps and bounds in the last few years and if you're talking to vendors out there about this they really shouldn't be offering a one-size-fits-all cloud platform for automation every product will have some standard functionality but they should come with a flexible approach to allow you to build your own business rules uh, alongside best practices to ensure a fit why is it important well cloud-based automation solutions they can be up and live and running in in a matter of days where compared to traditional on-premise solutions you'd be talking three to six months uh, to go live and that's from a vendor even being selected so obviously we focused on the current notice to UK business however there is a, a wider global trend that uh, appears to be forming and that appears to be a move from uh, post audit VAT returns to clearance processes. The reason behind this is uh, probably multitude of things. However, uh, it was highlighted in a report in late 2017 that there's some very significant gaps in the amount of VAT that's paid globally against what is estimated as owed. Now in uh, Europe, that gap is estimated at 150 to 250 billion euros. Globally, it's estimated at around about half a trillion euros. Of course, the advantage of a clearance process is that it becomes transparent, digital, and centrally easily controlled. So across Europe, uh, much like in the UK, um, most VAT reporting is done post audit, and we see that around the world as well. Um, What's interesting to see is the move towards clearance processes where all the submissions for purchases, invoicing, payments, etc. are managed by a centrally controlled system. Now, in Europe, there's only a few countries that are either following this or moving towards it. Uh, Portugal and Italy, for instance, being very early adopters and Spain moving towards the process in certain areas. Um, the graphic on your screen, though, would suggest that this is a trend that's expected to uh, to continue to grow. From our perspective and in conclusion, making tax digital in the UK could be seen as simply the first step along this pathway. So we've uh, we've gone through about 20 minutes so far, and as I said, I did want to spend some time just going through a few of the the FAQs that that we found whilst we were out there researching the the content for this and trying to understand the notice and talking to some other third parties as well. Uh, so first up, um, the the one that seemed to be asked the most is what's the soft landing period? So. The term soft landing was introduced very early in the making tax digital for VAT discussions, and that meaning has changed over time. So the, the legal meaning for this now, which is defined in the notice, uh, is particularly important for organizations whose ERP or finance package isn't compatible, uh, maybe out of life, or it may be a legacy system, for example. So during the first 12 months, HMRC will accept the cut and paste of data as a digital link for the um, within your internal process however um, even if it's done solely via a computer it would not be termed automated so it wouldn't be termed as a digital link at a later date now the exception to this in the soft landing is for the final submission that has to happen as a digital link it cannot be done as copy and paste as of the first of april that's where the API tools and the bridging tools will come into play. And there is a link to one of those on one of the final slides. So the second question that, that came up, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, is can the portal that most organizations still use uh, be used after this comes into play? No, it's as simple as that. No, it cannot be. 
Um, it would constitute a break in the digital transfer if you're copying and pasting your, your codes in. Uh, similarly, with paper-based filing, sim you cannot do it uh, as of the 1st of April or as of your first submission after the 1st of April, maybe a bit uh, of a better way to, to phrase that. And on which note, uh, question three is when will it have an impact? So it will apply for your first full VAT period that starts on or after the 1st of April. Um, so three examples for, for that, and these would assume that you file quarterly. So a 31st of March 2019 end date, your first VAT quarter under the legislation would be from the 1st of April. A 30th of April end date, your first VAT quarter would start on the 1st of May 2019, and then if we take that logic through, the 31st of May end date, and your first submission would be on the 1st of June. So the final one that we're gonna have a look at, the fourth question, exemptions from the policy. We've mentioned one, and that's if your turnover is not above the threshold. Uh, there are a, a number of others uh, included within the, uh, the notice, including things such as religious beliefs are incompatible with requirements, um, reasons of age, disability, remoteness of location. Um, in HMRC's words, any other reason that mean it's not reasonably practical for the business owner to use digital tools to keep business records or submit returns. Uh, for example, a business without an internet connection uh, because it's on an island that's off the grid. And those are, are words that uh, have come up regularly in, in looking at this. And then finally, the, the one that's highlighted is businesses that are subject to insolvency procedures. In order to apply for exemption, you need to contact HMRC's VAT helpline. So before I take a quick look at any questions that you may have posed to wrap up this morning, uh, please do remember, ladies and gentlemen, this is our understanding of the potential impacts to accounts payable and finance. Every company and every organization is individual and will have its own circumstances to consider. We would strongly advise you that you speak to your own auditors, internal and external, to ensure that what either you are currently doing or are planning to do will be compliant with this legislation. And of course, please feel free to reach out to us if you have questions and you would like us to try and answer those. We will always try and do that to the, the best of our ability. Okay, so questions. Let's see what we've had posed during the course of the webinar. So we've definitely got a few bits and pieces here. Okay, does this change how long we store uh, documentation for as opposed to how we store it? There is nothing explicit within the notice or the legislation that changes any rules regarding how long data is stored for or who is responsible for storing it. Purely what is required and how. Um, so current rules would still apply for accounts payable, accounts receivable, and certainly for any other um, element of the finance team that this, this could impact. What is metadata? Metadata is a series of electronic tags that are machine generated and they uh, read as a, an index, if you like, of what has happened with a an electronic document during its processing. So that will include a date and time stamp on receipt of an invoice, whether that's as an email or maybe something that you have scanned once it becomes digital, it's stamped. It will include things um, such as usernames for anybody who's done anything to that document uh, for approval purposes, for example. Um, I hope that answers that well enough for you. Okay, there's still a lot of questions coming through here. Um, sorry, guys, just bear with me. What about the copying and pasting as well as macros of data from Excel, example spreadsheets? Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, whoever posed that 
question. Uh, I can see who it is. I will come back to you afterwards. I, I, want, I just need to get a bit of clarity on that uh, from you. I'm not 100% sure I understand the question there. Um, dun, dun, dun. Who will audit compliance on the rules? It's an interesting question. So fundamentally, if you don't comply with the final stage, which is the upload of your VAT return using a digital link, it means that you fail to submit a VAT return because there's no other way of doing it. At that stage, if you fail to, to uh, make a VAT return, uh, I'm sure HMRC will uh, be very interested in digging around as deep as they possibly can into everything else to uh, ensure compliance. It's a bit of an awkward one, uh, that one, but simply put, you can't submit them any other way. Um, we, what remains to be seen is much like DTR, uh, due to report is what else happens afterwards. Okay, I'm gonna try and grab one more. Uh, okay, can you explain again when we are likely to have to keep the physical invoice itself rather than just scan or store an electronic version of the same? So if you receive your invoices as a piece of paper and you key the data into a finance system manually, as the notice reads, in that instance, you would be required to retain the piece of paper that you originally received. It states you have to keep the original documents that would be the prime example of where that's most likely to come into play um, certainly that's how it reads that's how the black and white of that that notice is is uh, is written Uh, so final one, just because it's an interesting one, uh, what is classed as fully digital? What if we have an OCR engine and manual intervention takes over to deal with a correction? Absolutely fine, because you're not copying and pasting data. So what I imagine you're referencing here is that maybe it's uh, the system has misread a field or um, you know, the the lines don't quite add up to the total because of um, maybe an, an early payment discount or, or something of that nature. Uh, in that instance, because what you are doing is you are updating the data in a system, all of those corrections and amendments are being tracked and traced and stored for audit purposes so that at any time somebody can see what happens. So in that instance you don't need to worry about maybe retaining that original piece of paper the trail that is there within your ocr engine and platform would be fine for the discrepancy management certainly that's how we understand it and the way that the second example appears to be phrased um, ladies and gents we we've got a whole load more questions here i will um, what i'm going to do is i'm going to come back to as many of you as possible at the uh, at the end of the webinar i will uh, I'll try and drop emails out to everybody who's asked questions. I don't want to keep people hanging on much longer. If you have any other questions, feel free to, to get in touch with us. Uh, we, we will try and answer as many as we can and, and be as clear as we can around this. The link to the presentation will remain valid. We will send out a copy of this recording as well, uh, or a link to a copy of the recording for you all that have joined us. Finally, I'd just like to thank you. Thank you for joining us this morning. We hope that this has uh, been insightful and has, has maybe made you think a little bit more about the potential impacts on your business that this legislative change could have.